Thomas Wheeler is a former chief executive officer of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company, and he tells a story on himself. He said that while he and his wife were traveling one day out in the country, they were driving on an old country road and he noticed that they were a little bit low on gas. He became concerned that they might not make it into town and so he pulled off into the driveway of this dumpy little gas station. It looked kind of seedy and dirty but he knew he needed some gas. And the one gas station attendant who was working there that day walked up to the car and said, what can I do for you? He said, well, would you mind filling it up while I check the oil myself in the car? He checked the oil and realized he was a quart low, so he started to put the extra quart into his car. And he noticed while he was doing that, that his wife was talking with the attendant and smiling. They looked like they were having a real enjoyable conversation with one another. Then the attendant and his wife noticed that he was looking at them, and the attendant just stood up straight and walked away back into the gas station. Well, he followed the attendant in, and he just paid him for the gas, and the oil and got back in the car, drove a little bit, and then he said to his wife, you know, I noticed that you were being kind of friendly with that gas station attendant back there. Do you know him? And his wife said, well, yeah, to be honest with you, I, I do know him. We went to high school together. But not just that, we actually dated pretty seriously for about a year. He started laughing. His wife said, what's so funny? He said, well, just think, if I hadn't have come along, you'd be married to a gas station attendant instead of a chief executive officer. She looked at him and said, huh, dear, I hate to tell you this, but if I'd married him, he'd be the chief executive officer and you'd be a gas station attendant. Some women out there might say amen to that. But this is what Jesus said to that. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's easy for us to quote that verse when we see other people exalting themselves and being arrogant letting their egos become inflated around us. But it's not so easy when we're the ones who feel like our egos need to be built up. And we want to brag a little bit in order to get others to compliment us and look at our status in life. You see, we all want, and indeed we all need, to know that we're important. We need to know that our lives matter and that our lives make a difference. The story is told about a woman who had worked really hard on raising her family, doing everything for her family that she could, taking care of them, and yet she received very little appreciation from any of her family members. So one day she looked at her husband and she said, Phil, honey, I was just thinking, when I die, you're probably going to spend a lot of money to buy flowers to decorate my casket and to put around in the funeral home, won't you? He looked at her and he said, well, of course, honey, of course I'll do that for you. What on earth making you ask a question like that? She said, well, I was just thinking. When I'm laying in that casket, I probably won't appreciate those flowers at all. But if you just bring home one flower every now and again while I'm alive, it sure would mean a lot to me. 
My friends, we all need to know that we're important, that we're recognized, that people see us, that we're appreciated. But when our need to be recognized, when our need to know that we're important goes awry, when it becomes so all-consuming that we see other people as our competition instead of our companions on the journey in life, then we are missing out on the kingdom joy that Jesus came to bring to each one of us. Jesus wants each one of us to know that we're important. But it's sad how much people in our world today are seeking to make themselves the most important person in the world. Seeking to see other people as competition rather than companions in life. I once read in a newspaper article that back in 1970, two researchers for the Kinsey Institute began a rather extensive study on sexual attitudes of 3,000 adults. It took them about 10 years to complete their research. And in 1980, the work was completed and almost ready for publication. But there was one small detail that remained. Albert D. Claussen and Colin Williams were the authors of the survey. And they still needed to agree on whose name would appear first on the research document. Other researchers were inter interested in the study results. And so a decade later, in 1990, they finally intervened to resolve the issue. Apparently, these other academic researchers thought that 10 years was a little bit too long for those two men to decide whose name would go first. Sadly, this rhetoric and actions that are taken by a multitude of people who seek to inflate their own egos and demand that their status be recognized has led to the plethora of hate and violence that we see in our world today. As inflated egos broadcast their need for attention on multiple media outlets and in echo chambers. It's no longer just a silly, incidental thing in life. That's why it's so refreshing when I can find people who make light of themselves, people who are in the spotlight who don't take themselves so seriously. Like the one Democratic senator I heard of who said to his colleagues that he wanted to take a polygraph test because he wanted to find out what all this lie detector fuss was all about. And then this silver-haired, flamboyant senator came back and he told the press, well, I flunked the lie detector test when I started a sentence with these words, in my humble opinion, And so we laugh because we can't think of politicians as being humble. But it's not just politicians who have difficulty with humility and looking out for one and number one. There are people in this community, there are people in our families, there are even people in God's holy church who live with inflated egos that need to be stroked and who view others and other churches and other people and other family members 
as their competition rather than their companions. Competition seems to be a driving force in our world today. Driving force. And some people may say that competition is the American way. But competition is not always the best way to live our lives. I'm reminded of what happened years ago when the Federal Center of Disease Control wanted to do some research to find a cure for AIDS. And so they pitted different teams that were working in-house on research to find a cure for AIDS. They pitted them against one another in a competition. But according to Rosabeth Moss Cantor in her book, When Giants Learn to Dance, those team members who were highly educated professionals and scientists, they couldn't handle the competition. In their zeal to win at all cost, Team members sabotage the work of other researchers. They tampered with the evidence. They destroyed equipment. They contaminated the results. Turnover increased to 75%. There was so much jealousy going on in the Federal Center of Disease Control among those teams. But what's worse is the tragic loss that is unmeasurable of all the research that was done and the results that could have been found. Win at any cost is not a healthy motivation. There's a place for competition in our world, my friends. But Jesus says that there is a better way for us to live our lives than competing with others. Listen to the text from the Gospel of Luke that was shared partly with us today in the skit. It's from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is the guest at a fancy dinner his host is a ruler. He's also a Pharisee. And it's the kind of supper that would have been covered by food magazines around the world. It had the kind of guest list that would have made headlines in all the major media outlets. The host was a prominent man in the community. Luke says that he was a Pharisee, which means that he traveled in the right Jewish circles of the day. People looked up to him. People paid attention to him. And so he invited several people over for dinner at his house, and he invited this new celebrity in Israel Jesus of Nazareth, to come and be his guest at this meal. Everyone had heard about Jesus. They'd heard about his teachings and how people, thousands of people, had gathered to hear Jesus' teachings. They heard about Jesus' healings, and they heard that Jesus had even performed miracles. And so he invites Jesus to come to this dinner that they might get to know this superstar, this celebrity, this important person. And you have to understand in this culture, who you invited into your home said a lot about your own status. So if a superstar is coming to your house, you must be a superstar too. Your own status is elevated. It was a nice affair. And I imagine that in my mind's eye, I can see them sitting with that beautiful spread of food in front of them as they're overlooking a water view with the sun not quite setting yet, 
because it is on the Sabbath. And as they look out at that big expanse and enjoy that meal, the host, the Pharisee, turns to Jesus and says, Honored guest, would you like to say a few words to the people who are gathered here? Jesus smiles and he says, Sure. You know, I noticed the way all of you, when you came in here, how you maneuvered to get the best seat. You wanted to sit by me, or you wanted to sit by the ruler. You wanted to get the finest and the best seats at the table. I noticed you doing that. And that might work here in this culture where we are right now. But let me tell you, when you're invited to a marriage feast, don't sit in the best seat. Sit at a lower seat. Because if you sit at the best seat, someone more important than you might come in and the host will come to you and will say, uh, you need to move, you're not important enough, you need to go over here. Instead, sit at the low seat, and the host will say to you, No, 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 why are you sitting way back there? Come on, move up to the front. And you will be honored in that way. Give yourself the luxury of being invited to a higher place. And then Jesus said that famous line, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. My friends, this is a judgment parable. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is warning us in this parable it's as if Jesus had just said, you want to know how important you are? Stick your finger in a bowl of water and then pull it out and look at the hole. Jesus is telling us, don't look at others as your competition. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. This is a parable that is giving us a glimpse into what it means to live in the kingdom of God. It is a parable that says don't jockey for positions in the kingdom of God. Don't play the games of self-aggrandizement. Self I can't even say it. It just sticks in my throat. Don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to, is the way the Apostle Paul put it. But humility, my friends, is a risk. It is a risk for each one of us. And yet, in the traditional passage of Scripture that is often read on Christ the King Sunday, the judgment parable about the last days, when the king comes and he divides the people, and he says to those on one side, Enter now the kingdom of God, for when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison or sick, you visited me. And the people said, When was it, Lord, that we saw you hungry or thirsty and gave you food and drink? When was it that we saw you in prison or sick and visited you? And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. Those persons who serve others live with humility, not thinking of themselves and their own status in life and seeing others as their competition and wanting to be viewed by others as important, but they see the needs of others around them and simply want to make life better for others around them. Living this way, my friends, is something we know in our hearts and in our heads, but it means taking risk. And maybe that's why so many people don't live this way. 
It means risking that other people will take advantage of you and that other people will look down on you. We may miss out on some temporary rewards on this side of heaven, my friends, but Jesus says our reward will be great in heaven and we will know joy in the living here and now. Back in 1989, there was a couple named Reb and Jacquet, and they were preparing to open a restaurant in North Carolina. They had worked hard, and they had saved their money, and they were, had this dream of owning a restaurant, and they were just about ready to open it. But on the morning of the final inspection, before they could open their doors to the public, Hurricane Hugo hit. The worst hurricane that had hit North Carolina in its history. The hurricane destroyed homes and businesses. Many of you remember Hurricane Hugo coming through South Carolina. Somehow, though, Reb and Jacquet's new restaurant was still standing. A deputy sheriff stopped by and told them that theirs was only a handful of buildings that were still standing in their town. So Reb and Jacquet decided they would share their good fortune with the community by giving away all of the food that they already had in their freezer. And instead of opening up the restaurant at that time, they just put out a sign that said, Free Sandwiches for all of the rescue workers, for all of the first responders who are here. And they were quickly filled up with tired and grateful police officers, firefighters, electrical linemen, EMTs, all of those first responders. But when they learned that a restaurant right down from them was selling meals at an extraordinarily high price to the people who lived in the town. They decided they would just offer food to anybody who was in need. Anyone in the community who needed it was welcome to come in and just eat for free. And a strange thing happened. Inspired by their generosity, People in neighboring communities all around emptied out their own freezers and they brought food in to share with that community of people. Local grocery stores and dairies sent to them food, milk, butter, things to serve the people in that community. And without them even asking, the people who were receiving the food started cleaning off the counters and mopping the floors and doing things to help take care of the other patrons in the restaurant. And within a few days, Reb and Jacquet said they served 16,000 meals to the members of their hard-hit community. In the midst of devastating circumstances, two people put the needs of others in the community before their own needs, before their own dreams, before their own egos. They were humble and said, we just did what we felt Jesus wanted us to do. In Jesus' eyes, my friend, life is not a competition. It is a celebration of community. Our Bible story today ends with these words. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your sisters, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, you may be invited back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so the question before us today as we celebrate Christ as our King is what would change in our lives and in our community and in this church and in the world indeed if we would follow Jesus' view of life as a celebration 
a life of humility, a life of sharing God's love with others. Henry Nouwen asked himself that question long ago. Henry Nouwen was a priest and a professor and a famous author whose books many of you may have read. He taught at some of the most prestigious Ivory League schools in the nation, but he gave up prestigious positions in order to look work at La Marche, a community of people with intellectual and physical disabilities. He wanted to find God by serving people at the margins of life. At La Larche, Henry Nouwen befriended a young man named Trevor. And when Trevor was sent to the hospital for an evaluation, Henry Nouwen planned to visit him there at the hospital. And when the hospitals heard that Henry Nouwen was coming, they got so excited that this famous person was coming to their hospital that they decided they would put together a wonderful luncheon. And they invited him to come to the luncheon in their golden dining room, their executive dining room, because they wanted to honor him. When Henry Nouwen walked in to that golden room and he saw the lavish amount of food prepared, he looked around and he said, uh, where's Trevor? And the officials looked at him and said, oh, patients aren't allowed in here. This is only for the VIPs, for the executives, for the board members, for the doctors. And Henry Nouwen said, Trevor needs to be here. I'm not staying unless Trevor is allowed to eat in here. And so the officials found Trevor and brought him into that golden room. And as the hospital official, officials gathered around Henry and tried to catch his attention, Trevor just stood up and he started singing, If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass and cheer and show it. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. And at first, all of those hospital officials and doctors felt awkward and funny and embarrassed. But Henry Nouwen began to sing that song with Trevor. And pretty soon, all of the other hospital officials joined in the singing too. Joyfully singing. If you're happy and you know it, raise your glass. And smiles and laughter broke out. That's the kind of atmosphere Jesus came to bring. An atmosphere of joy. An atmosphere of laughter. An atmosphere of love. May we have the faith and the courage to so live with Christ as our King. Amen.